Well, we are here celebrating this Festival of Tabernacles, celebrating the time when the kingdom of God will rule over the nations of the world. And there are things that must occur and must come to pass between now and the time when that government, when that kingdom is set up and is established and rules in the affairs of mankind. In many ways, the Bible could be likened to a tale of two cities. Now, perhaps you hadn't thought of it that way, but you see the Bible opens in the book of Genesis with two cities, and it closes in the book of Revelation with two cities. In Genesis chapter 10 and chapter 11, we read of Babylon. We read of the beginning of the kingdom of Nimrod, that the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And as we go on and read there in Genesis 11, we read that approximately a hundred years after the flood, mankind was organized by Nimrod to build a great tower, a symbol of defiance of God, a symbol of defiance of the will of God. And it represented the organization of man's system built and constructed in rebellion against God. And so we open in the book of Genesis, in the post-flood world, we open with Babylon. And as we go through the pages of the Bible, we find from time to time we read of Babylon. And when we get to the book of Revelation, we read of Babylon. And finally, in Revelation 18, we read that Babylon the Great will be destroyed. That the time is coming when the great city Babylon will be cast down and will become a hold of demons and foul spirits. And it will become a great abyss throughout the thousand-year period. Now also in the book of Genesis, we read of another city, a city to which we're introduced in Genesis 14. Because we read there of Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and we read that Abraham met an individual identified as Melchizedek. Melchizedek, king of Salem, or Jerusalem, as we know it better. Melchizedek, king of Salem. Now, when we're introduced to Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14, we don't know a whole lot about him just from Genesis 14, except that Abraham recognized him uh, as an individual to whom tithes should be paid and that he was an individual who was above Abraham because he blessed Abraham. And Abraham, of course, is the father of the faithful, so we're given uh, just a very dim insight into the greatness and the majesty of Melchizedek. But when we come forward to Hebrews chapter 7, Paul identifies Melchizedek as the one who actually became Jesus Christ, the one who was without father, without mother, without beginning of days or end of life. The one who abides a priest continually. And that he appeared there as the king of Salem. The location from which he operated at that point in his dealings and appearances to Abraham and later to Isaac and to Jacob. So we're introduced there to the city of Jerusalem in Genesis 14. And when we come back to the end of the book of Revelation... What do we find in Revelation 21 when John looks up and he says, Behold, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. The city that has foundations, whose maker and builder is God. You know, we're told that Abraham looked for a city. Abraham dwelt as a pilgrim, as a sojourner. But he looked for a city whose maker and builder is God. That heavenly Jerusalem that is going to be established after the millennium. We read of the time during the millennium, after Christ returns, when the law will go forth out of Zion and the word of God from Jerusalem. So we read through the scriptures of a tale of two cities. A conflict between two fundamental ways of life and two totally opposing governments. The outcome of that conflict is already determined. It's already determined because Babylon the Great, 
is fallen, is fallen, we're told in Revelation 18. Her desolation, her destruction will come in one hour. Babylon the Great, which must yet finally emerge in its final stage, is to be destroyed by Jesus Christ. I want us to focus a little bit on some of this account and some of the events that are to occur and some of the things that very specifically relate uh, to uh, Babylon and to the things that are going to transpire. It is important that we understand where we stand in the flow of events. Now, we're going to concentrate quite a bit on the book of Daniel because Daniel is a very pivotal area of giving us an outline of these events and certainly focusing in on Babylon because Daniel, you remember, was carried to Babylon as a captive. In Daniel chapter 4, we have a very remarkable section of Scripture because this is a chapter that was actually written by a Gentile king, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, maybe you never thought of that. You didn't know that Nebuchadnezzar wrote part of the Bible, but notice Genesis 4, or Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwelt upon the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God has wrought toward me. This was actually an open letter that Nebuchadnezzar composed and sent out to his empire. And we have it preserved for us in the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar tells a remarkable story in this open letter. He had a dream, and it was a very troublesome dream, as he describes, that um, in this dream in verse 5 that uh, he had, he talks about it in verse 6, that uh, there was a decree uh, that uh, he made wanting to get this vision interpreted. He wanted to understand it. And so we begin to, on down in verse 10, have the dream described. Nebuchadnezzar saw a great tree, and this tree had great branches, and it was filled with leaves, and there were birds and beasts that made their home in that tree and under the shade of it. It was a very impressive tree. And then we're told in verse 12 that there was a voice from heaven, a decree of the watchers that said, Hew down the tree, in verse 14, cut off the branches, shake off the leaves, scatter the fruit, and the beasts, let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from the branches. Nevertheless, the tree was cut down, but it was not uprooted. Now, that's important. We'll come back to that later. The tree was cut down, but it was not uprooted. The root, the the stump, was banded with iron and brass. The tree cut down, but the stump remained in the ground and was banded. Well, we find that Nebuchadnezzar was to have, was to, according to verse 16, was to have his heart changed from a man's heart to become like an animal. He went, in other words, absolutely start raving mad. And that seven times were to pass over him. Seven times. And this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones. To the intent that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will and sets over it even the basest of men. God determines the rise and fall of kingdoms and empires. That's all a part of the plan of God. You know, we're told in the, in the book of Acts that the Father has reserved the times and the seasons into His own power. The rise and fall of great powers, the ebb and flow of empires, is not merely a matter of happenstance or accident. The rise and fall of these empires and the timing of that rise and fall is a part of the plan and the purpose of God because God rules over all. And he has reserved the times and the seasons into his own power. Well, Nebuchadnezzar was very troubled as a result of this dream. And he called Daniel, and Daniel came in to explain it to him. And Daniel listened to the recounting of the dream. And Daniel was really struck 
Daniel had developed an affection for Nebuchadnezzar and was very bothered at the consequence of what this portended for Nebuchadnezzar personally. And so he finally, after about an hour, he composed himself and he began to address the explanation to Nebuchadnezzar and to tell him what was going to come to pass and how he would be driven forth from among men in verse 25. How he would go out into the, into the wilderness and would absolutely be like an animal, would, would, go in, would go start raving mad, and that seven times would pass over him until he had come to know that the Most High rules in the affairs of men and gives, it gives things to whomsoever he will. Well, Daniel then gave Nebuchadnezzar some advice. He told him that in verse uh, 27, he said, Let your, this is my advice to you, break off your sins by righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, that it may be a lengthening of your tranquility. He said, Nebuchadnezzar, if you will demonstrate to God a change of heart by the change of your actions, if you will demonstrate to God a change, the fruits of repentance, then perhaps this won't come upon you in this way. Well, you can believe Nebuchadnezzar was greatly impressed, and he was walking very softly for a period of time. But you know how human nature is, as a little time goes by and lightning didn't strike. I'm sure that in the first days and weeks after this, Nebuchadnezzar was on the best behavior of his life. But the weeks turned into months, and the months began to go by. And Nebuchadnezzar began to let that dream recede into the back of his mind, and it was not nearly so real to him. And one day, a year later, verse 29, at the end of twelve months, he was walking in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And the king said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built by the power of my might for the glory of my kingdom? Look at what I have done. And while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from you. And Nebuchadnezzar was driven forth, and seven times were to pass upon him, were to pass over him. And so we find in verse 33 that Nebuchadnezzar went insane and ran off into the woods, and after a period of time, actually took on uh, a wild appearance as his beard and his hair and his fingernails grew, uh, and he lived like a wild animal in the woods. In verse 34, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, and he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, Why do you? So Nebuchadnezzar's reason at that point returned to him, and he was restored to his kingdom. And so in verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Nebuchadnezzar had learned a very valuable lesson. Now, before we go on from there, let's take note the we're told that seven times were to pass over Nebuchadnezzar. Now, we can very clearly identify exactly uh, how the Bible uses that expression. We don't have to, to guess or just suppose. Well, let's go back to the book of Revelation, chapters 11 and 12, and I want to show you some interchangeable phrases that are used that we might clearly understand exactly how much time passed. In Daniel chapter, or Daniel, Revelation chapter 11, in verse 3, we read, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 
a thousand two hundred and three score days. In other words, twelve hundred and sixty days. Coming on, uh, coming on down just uh, a. Uh, if we notice up in verse two, verse three talks about two witnesses prophesying twelve hundred and sixty days. Verse two of Revelation eleven says, "The court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles." And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty-two months. Okay, forty-two months. Now, if we come back to Revelation chapter 12, we read in verse 6 that the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared of God, and she was there twelve hundred and sixty days. But if we come on down to verse 14, we find that the woman was given two wings of an eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, and she is nourished there for a time and times and half a time. Now, we have three different things that are used here. 1,260 days, 42 months, and time, times, and half a time. Well, 42 months is pretty simple to figure out because 36 months is three years, right? And six more months makes 42, so 42 months is three and a half years. Well, if you take 1,260 days and just divide it by 30, you know, 30 days, month of 30 days, just divide it out. 30 into 1,260. Come up with 42 months, right? You divided it out. So 42 months is, tw- is uh, uh, 42 30 day months is 1,260 days. And that's equated also with time, times, and half a time. So the expression time, times, and half a time is obviously equated with three and a half years, or 1,260 days. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was told that seven times were to pass over him. So that's twice this period of time. That's twice a three and a half year period. Seven times is twice time, times, and a half a time. So, if... Time times and a half a time is equated to 1260 days, then seven times is equated to double that, or 2520 days. So this period of seven times, or seven years, 2520 days went by during which Nebuchadnezzar roamed the wilderness and his sanity returned. He looked up and he began to praise God. To recognize that God rules in the affairs of men. Nebuchadnezzar, after seven years, had learned a valuable lesson. He knew that all that walk in pride, God is able to abase. And he had learned that lesson. But unfortunately, that lesson was not conveyed to his successors. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar had written an open letter. Uh, Daniel chapter 4 is a record of that letter. So it's not a matter that his successors uh, didn't know it, hadn't heard the account, because we pick up the story in the very next chapter of Daniel, Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5, we read that Belshazzar, that Belshazzar, Belshazzar the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords, and he drank wine before the thousand. Now, Belshazzar was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. And when we pick up the story in Daniel chapter 5, we have moved down about just a little over 20 years after Nebuchadnezzar was restored to his throne. So, Daniel chapter 5 picks up the story just a little over 20 years after chapter 4 ends. Belshazzar was the grandson. His father was Nabonidus, Nebuchadnezzar's son. Nabonidus was with a Babylonian army elsewhere in the empire. And Belshazzar was left uh, in Babylon as the king. He was the joint king or the co-ruler with his father Nabonidus and was actually the one administering the government in Babylon while his father was elsewhere in the empire. And so we read here in Daniel chapter 5 of Belshazzar, who made a great feast. And if you go through it carefully and you look at the secular historical accounts, because there are many, Herodotus uh, The Greek historian uh, gives a detailed history of the Persian Wars, and he gives a detailed history of the fall of Babylon. And Belshazzar's feast took place on the evening of the new moon of the seventh month, or that time that we recognize as the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets. Belshazzar's feast took place on the evening of the Feast of Trumpets, the new moon of the seventh month, 
in the year 539 B.C. Now, Babylon was under siege. I want to set the stage a little bit for Daniel chapter 5. Babylon was under siege. The armies of Cyrus the Great of Persia had approached Babylon. Belshazzar was very contemptuous of what the Persians purposed to do because great Babylon, impregnable Babylon, the walls of Babylon could not be breached. Herodotus tells us that the walls were 335 feet high and 85 feet thick. There was a chariot track around the top. There were a hundred brass gates. How can you breach a city like that? Great Babylon. There was the river that flowed through Babylon. There was a source of water. Belshazzar laughed at the idea that these Persians would have the audacity to think that they could lay siege to Great Babylon. And so he made a feast. And he laughed at the Persians. And he drank wine, and after he had drank for a little while, verse 2, he commanded that they bring the golden and silver vessels which his ancestor Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines might drink therein. So the sacred vessels held in the treasury of Babylon, the sacred vessels taken from Jerusalem, by Nebuchadnezzar, decades previously, were now brought into the banqueting room. And we find in verse 3 that they brought the golden vessels that were taken, and they brought them in. In verse 4, they drank wine, and they praised the gods of gold, and the gods of silver, and the gods of brass, and the gods of iron, and the gods of wood, and the gods of stone. And you better believe by the time they got down to the gods of wood and stone, they were pretty well looped. Uh, you know, they were drinking praises to this God and that God and sort of working their way, working their way down, showing absolute contempt for the God of heaven. But what was the lesson Nebuchadnezzar had learned? All that walk in pride, he is able to abase. And as Belshazzar was there, drinking his wine and laughing and making jokes and giving praise to the various idols of Babylon, there appeared something that provided instant sobriety for Belshazzar and his guests. All of a sudden, there was a hand, a disembodied hand that appeared out of nowhere that began to write on the plaster strange words. Meany, meany, tekel, you farson. Now, as Belshazzar saw this, we find as we go on down that... We're told in verse 6, when, when this was written up there, in verse 6, the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. Now, you might want to look up that expression, the joints of his loins were loosed. Uh, that is a King James euphemism for the fact that he had a very embarrassing accident about that time. Uh, that just absolutely, he was so frightened that he didn't know what to do. Uh, and... Uh, so he did. And his knees smote one against another. He was absolutely petrified in the midst of all of this drinking and all of this carousing. Here was a hand writing on the wall. The handwriting on the wall. And he didn't know what to do. He wanted someone to interpret. Now, let's understand, those words are very strange to us. They were The words themselves were not so strange to Belshazzar because uh, these are forms of the term mina, shekel, and perez, which were weights or me uh, measurements that were weights. But you know, if you saw something similar and the words on the wall were tons, tons, pounds, and ounces, it would be still, you might know what the word itself meant, but it would be meaningless in that context. And Belshazzar knew that whatever this was, it certainly wasn't meaningless. And he offered to make someone, whoever could tell him, the third ruler of the kingdom. That, of course, is because he himself was the second ruler. We've already commented on that. Well, his mother, the queen mother, told him that there was a man in the days of his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar who was held in high esteem and high repute by Nebuchadnezzar. 
and who was noted as an interpreter of dreams. But you know, Belshazzar hadn't had any need for Daniel. And he maybe had heard of Daniel, but he was ready to call in anyone, and so he called in Daniel to tell him. And Daniel told him. He started out by making great promises to Daniel, and Daniel said, you keep your rewards, I don't need them. But Daniel told him, he said, this is the... This is the uh, this is the writing, verse 25, that was written. Mini, mini, tekel, you farson. And this is the interpretation of the thing. Mini, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you are weighed in the balance and found wanting. Perez, the kingdom is divided and given unto the Medes and the Persians. And Belshazzar commanded that they bring and put royal robes on Daniel. In verse 31, uh, verse 30, in that night, was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Mede took the kingdom. Darius the Mede, the uncle of Cyrus, actually was the one who led the troops in. Now, how could they come into great Babylon? Great, impenetrable Babylon with the great massive walls. Well, you see, it seems that Cyrus and his Persians had been busy. And they had come up with a plan. And there was a canal that was being dug earlier that connected the river that flowed under Babylon with another stream. There was a canal that was dug, and the final levee was broken through that night. And when it was, the waters began to flow in this diversionary canal, and the water level of what was flowing under what was flowing through Babylon, the water level in that riverbed began to drop and drop as it flowed right on through. And fairly soon, there was a dry riverbed that went down underneath these giant, massive walls. All the while, Belshazzar was praising the gods of gold and silver. He was having his great party and his great celebration filled with pride about great Babylon. And the Persian troops marched under those city walls, opened the gates of Babylon from the inside, and the troops came in. Cyrus took, once he recognized what was happening, he took his troops elsewhere, uh, he, or some of his troops elsewhere. He went elsewhere, and Darius was actually the one that entered into the city and took over the kingdom, uh, took it in, on behalf of his nephew, Cyrus. In that very night, Belshazzar was taken and slaughtered. In that very night, Babylon fell. In one night, great Babylon. The lesson that Nebuchadnezzar had learned had been very quickly forgotten. Now let's look a little further. Because we find that what happened here sets the stage for events that are to come. Nebuchadnezzar learned a lesson. A lesson that his successors did not learn. We find that 2,520 days passed over Nebuchadnezzar from the time that the tree was chopped down and the stump was left and was banded. The 2,520 days passed over until the stump, until the bands were loose, the bands were cut, and the stump began to sprout forth. Now, it's very interesting if we look at Daniel 5 and we look at this handwriting on the wall because, you see, these were numbers and these were weights. The mina, the shekel, and the peres were weights. The shekel was the smallest of the weights. There were 50 shekels in a mina, 25 shekels in a peres. Now, let's just do a little addition here. I want to show you something in verse 25 of Daniel chapter 5. Mina is mentioned twice. A mina consists... Uh, consisted of 50 shekels. That's mentioned twice, so that's 100 shekels. Then the shekel itself is mentioned once, so that makes one more. And Perez consisted of 25 shekels. If you add it up, you come up to 126. Now, you may say, well, what's the point of that? And what does that have to do with anything? Well, remember, these are numbers that are weights that are to be divided. That was the significance of each of the words. Uh, your, king, your days are numbered. Uh, you are weighed in the balances. And tonight it's divided. The significance of these terms was number, weight, and division. These were numbers that were weights that were to be divided. Now, we find here that we have weights that 
added up to the equivalent of 126 shekels. But that was not as far down as those numbers could be divided, because if you look back in Leviticus chapter 26, or excuse me, Leviticus 27, Leviticus 27 and verse 25, And all your estimation shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Twenty jeras shall be the shekel. Now, these numbers that were weights added up to 126 shekels, but that's not as far down as these numbers could be divided if we utilize this, that the estimations are to be made according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Twenty jeras shall be the shekel. So there was a number, there was a unit of measurement smaller than the shekel, and that was the jera. You want to do a little multiplication, just multiply 20 times 126. 2,520. 2,520. Now, that's the number of days that were to pass over from the time that the tree was cut down in Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar learned a lesson that his successors did not. Now, seven literal times passed over Nebuchadnezzar, and seven prophetic times passed over Babylon. Because, you know, we're told in Numbers 14 and also in Ezekiel chapter 4 that in prophecy, a day is representative of a year. Now, if we come down looking at the fact that the tree was cut down, Babylon fell. You see, Nebuchadnezzar went through something. He was representative of that kingdom of Babylon, and he learned a lesson. But his kingdom did not. And so finally, when the fulfillment came, Babylon was cut down. Babylon was cut down. The tree was banded. The stump was not uprooted because the time was going to come when it would shoot forth shoots once again. Well, seven times, 2,520 years from the fall of Babylon in 539 B.C. on the Feast of Trumpets, if you come forward 2,520 years from that date, it brings you to the Feast of Trumpets of 1982. You can do the addition. Just remember that there is no year zero when you make your calculation. Now, it's very interesting that a string of events began to occur at that time that have set the stage or that have brought us to where we are and that are setting the stage. Because we were told, you see, that the, stump was, the tree was cut down, the stump was left, it was banded. Back in Job chapter 14, notice the statement. Job 14, 7, There is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Though the root thereof was old in the earth, and the stock thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth boughs like a plant. You see, the tree... The bands were loosed, and the tree began to sprout forth. Now, it didn't sprout up as a full tree all of a sudden. When, a, when shoots began to come forth from a stump or from the roots of a stump, you don't all of a sudden have a full-blown tree. But the 2,520 years came to an end. Very interesting that that very evening, the evening that began the Feast of Trumpets in 1982, was the evening that a remarkable event took place in Germany. The Social Democratic Party of Germany had governed in coalition with the Free Democrats for several years, and they were a much more, uh, they were a socialist-oriented government and much more accommodationist with Eastern Europe and with the Soviet Union. They had accepted and accommodated themselves to the fact that the Soviet Union's domination of Eastern Europe was part of the eternal order of things and that Germany itself would not be reunited. But on that evening of the Feast of Trumpets in 1982, a remarkable event took place, and that is the fact that, sort of out of the blue, the Free Democrats withdrew from the coalition, and the Germany's coalition government collapsed. And on the evening that began the Feast of Tabernacles two weeks later, a new government was sworn in, and that was a government headed by the Christian Democratic Party, which was the Roman Catholic political party in Germany. Now, we think in this country of separation of church and state, we ought to recognize that that is not uh, something that is a part of, uh, of the structure in many other nations, and that in many countries there are political parties that are directly affiliated and associated with a certain church. The Christian Democratic parties were 
established under the auspices of the Vatican in the aftermath of World War II and played a significant role in, in German and Italian uh, politics particularly. So the Christian Democratic Party came to power in Germany there 1982. It's very interesting that it was uh, just a few weeks later that Pope John Paul uh, made a remarkable statement as he was uh, on a 10-day trip to Spain. And he made a statement, a pronouncement that was addressed to all of Europe. Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals. And he said, I, Bishop of Rome and pastor of the Universal Church from Saratoga, issue to you, old Europe, a cry full of love. Give life to your roots. Give life to your roots. A remarkable chain of events was in progress. You see, it was on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles in 1978 the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, 1978, that the first non-Italian pope in centuries was elected, Pope John Paul II. You have to think about it a little bit to understand the significance that this held for for the Eastern Europeans. Because there was, in the aftermath of World War II, when the Soviet Union occupied many of the nations of Eastern Europe, there was an attitude and an atmosphere that settled over those people of helplessness and hopelessness, that God had abandoned them, if there was a God, when a Slavic pope was chosen. A man from behind the Iron Curtain, a Pole. This electrified Catholics all throughout, particularly Eastern Europe. They took it as a divine sign that God had not abandoned them. Well, Pope John Paul was elected pope on the last day of the feast in 1978, and on the Pentecost weekend of 1979, just a matter of months later, he made a trip back to Poland. And this trip set the stage for further events because it was during the feast of 1980 that solidarity, the Union solidarity, emerged in Poland. And just a matter of two years later, in 1982, On the last great day in 1982, solidarity was outlawed. Now, to all intents and purposes, as as people looked at it, they said, well, the communists have done it again. They have crushed any semblance of resistance. But, brethren, that was not to be the case. Oh, it had worked effectively in Czechoslovakia in 1968, and it had worked effectively in Hungary in 1956. It had worked before in East Germany... But this time, it simply represented a coiling and a compression of the spring and the tension built that was to erupt forth. Yes, a new government came to power in Germany. The Pope issued a cry for Europe to give life to its roots. Solidarity was crushed. But, brethren, God's time had come. The events began to build behind the scenes over the course of the next seven years. Seven literal times, seven years, that brought us forward. Seven years from the sundering of the bands. Brought us forward to the festival season of 1989. Do you remember that festival season? I remember that festival season very clearly. I remember sitting in my room, my motel room, watching the news on television. And the Berlin Wall was breached. The communist governments in Eastern Europe toppled like dominoes. You remember that festival season? You remember that right prior to the beginning of it, Solidarity, outlawed seven years earlier, went from being outlawed to being the government of Poland. And it was like electricity that spread throughout Europe, throughout Eastern Europe. And all the commentators were taken aback. They didn't understand what was going on. Uh, They were sitting there with their learned panels discussing the significance and saying, well, this certainly doesn't portend the unification of Germany. Something like that is very unlikely, perhaps, uh, maybe sometime. Oh, certainly it couldn't happen before the year 2000. Before the end of the year, the agreement had already been reached. An incredible chain of events took place in Europe. And the old order, the post-World War II order, passed into history. It passed away. It was gone through Poland and through East Germany, and through Czechoslovakia, and through Romania, all the way down 
throughout Eastern Europe. And then the communist regime and the Soviet Union itself began to teeter and totter. And today the Soviet Union is no more. The Soviet Union is no more. Russia has emerged, shorn of many of her old imperial possessions. Brethren, we live and have lived through in the last few years a most remarkable time. We are in one of those transition periods in history. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And in this dream, he saw a great image. Now, he didn't understand what the dream meant. In fact, he, the dream itself was gone from him. But Daniel told him what he had dreamed, and then he explained the significance of it. Nebuchadnezzar had a great dream. He saw a great image whose height reached unto heaven, as it appeared to him, just this massive statue. The head was of gold, the shoulders of silver, the thighs of brass, the legs of iron, and the image culminated in two feet, two feet with ten toes. And these feet were composed of a mixture of iron and potter's clay. And as he watched this great impressive image, a stone was cut out without hands, a stone of supernatural origin that came down and smashed the image on its toes. And when it did, the image was shattered to dust, and the dust blew away, and this stone, cut out of supernatural origin, became a great mountain and filled the earth. And Daniel explained to Nebuchadnezzar. He said in verse 37 of Daniel 2, You, O king, are a king of kings. You are a king of kings. And he said down in verse 38, You are this head of gold. Babylon, ruled by you is symbolized by this head of gold. In verse 39, After you shall arise another kingdom yet inferior to you, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Great kingdoms that are going to rise after you. Well, we read of the first transition because we just got through reading in Daniel chapter 5 of how the Medes and the Persians came in and Babylon fell in 539 B.C., and a second kingdom came in. The kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, symbolized by the shoulders and chest of silver. About 200 years later, there was another transition. Alexander the Great and his Greek troops crossed the Hellespont into Asia and defeated the Persians. And the Persian Empire fell. And Alexander's Greek empire, this third kingdom of brass, bore rule. Alexander himself died within a short time. But this Greek dominated this Hellenistic kingdom, divided among his successors, yes, but retaining a unity of the Greek language, of the Greek culture, of the Greek philosophy, retaining this Hellenistic flavor. The empire of the Greeks, which ruled over the entire Middle Eastern area. Until finally there arose a fourth kingdom. A kingdom of iron that began to swallow up the remains of this Hellenistic kingdom of Alexander. It swallowed up the, what had become the northern kingdom of the Seleucids taking their descent from one of Alexander's generals, Seleucus. They swallowed that up, the Romans did, and then finally swallowed up the Ptolemaic kingdom of Egypt in the south. And swallowed up the remains of Alexander's kingdom. And so we come down to this fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire. The Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and now the Romans. Now, there's an interesting thing that is pictured here on this image. It is emphasized that the two legs were of iron. That is emphasized, and that, of course, correlates with history because we find the Roman Empire uh, continued down as the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire, divided in the 4th century A.D., by the Emperor Constantine for administrative purposes. The Western Empire with its capital in Rome and the Eastern Empire with its capital in Constantinople, which Constantine, with all due humility, had named after himself. 
and had made that the capital of the Eastern Empire. Now, biblical prophecy and our attention has primarily been focused on the Western Empire. That was the empire centered at Rome, the empire that continued down as the Latin Germanic realm, dominated uh, by the Catholic Church and dominating Western European history for century after century in its revivals and declines. But that only represents the succession of the Western leg. You see, there was an Eastern leg as well, the Eastern Roman Empire, with its capital at Constantinople. The Eastern Roman Empire continued on down, known in latter history as the Byzantine Empire. But their rulers trade continued right on down as the Eastern Roman Empire, with the capital at Constantinople continued on down until Constantinople fell to the Turks in the 1450s. Just a matter of less than 50 years before Columbus discovered America, when the Eastern Roman Empire finally fell in the 1450s. But there was an event that had taken place just prior, right around the time of this fall, just prior to it, and that was a marriage that had taken place in Rome. It was performed by the Pope himself. It was the marriage of Sophia, who was the niece and ultimately the heiress of the Eastern Roman Empire, and she married a man who was the Grand Duke of Moscovy. When Constantinople fell, the Grand Duke of Moscovy traded in his old title for a new one. He now viewed Moscow as the third Rome. Constantinople was the second. And he himself took the title Caesar, the successor of the Eastern Roman Empire. And so as we come down emerged from the medieval period. All through the medieval period and on up until modern times, there were two rulers in Europe who claimed their title as successor to Caesar. You see, as we come on into modern times, we find there was a ruler who called himself Caesar. It's spelled out in the way we normally see it in English, C-Z-A-R, or sometimes T-S-A-R, the Tsar of the Russians. His title goes back to the Eastern Roman emperors. He was Caesar, the successor of Caesar in the East. But there was also one in the West down through the medieval period and on up to modern times who was also Caesar. We pronounce it in English Kaiser, which was simply the Germanic uh, pronunciation. Actually, if you look, the, the Latin pronunciation of Caesar was more like Kaiser. That's just simply spelled out in German. You see, the Holy Roman Emperors didn't call themselves Emperor. Emperor is an English word. No, they were Kaiser in the German. The term, the successors of Caesar, coming down in the Greek, Latin, Catholic realm of the West, or the, or the Latin, Germanic realm, excuse me, the Latin, Germanic, Catholic realm of the West, the Greek, Slavic, Orthodox realm of the East. And when we come down, we note that an interesting thing occurs. When you get down to the bottom of the image, you have two feet and ten toes. And the logical presupposition would be that you have five toes on each foot. There's no indication that the feet are deformed. You have ten toes, which means you've got five toes on each foot. And if the legs represent the Eastern and the Western Empire, and Mr. Armstrong explained that, you can go back in the old Who is the Beast booklet that was written way back in the 1930s originally. And he explained these two legs represented the Eastern and the Western Roman Empire. And as they come on down and they finally get to the bottom, and we have two feet and ten toes, then what do we have but rather the reconstitution of the whole thing? The Eastern and the Western portions that are once again to emerge. You see, brethren, the bands have been clipped, and the tree has begun to sprout, and the post-World War II era has passed into history, and there has been emerging on the scene in the years since a setting of the stage for the final act in the drama of this conflict between the two cities of Babylon and of Jerusalem. Because Babylon the Great is in the process of emerging. 
There are events that are going on behind the scenes. And you know when one act ends, the curtain is rung down. And there is a rearrangement of items on the stage. The stage is reset. The scenery is adjusted. And when the curtain finally rises, the stage looks vastly different. There are a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes. Events that are happening in Europe, events that are happening in the Middle East. It's a matter of record that there have been treks from both the, uh, from the Middle East to Rome, representatives of the Palestinian movement, representatives of the Israeli government meeting with representatives of the Vatican. There are various indications of, of certain things that have been agreed to. Time will have to tell exactly what has emerged at this point. But we know what ultimately shall emerge because we read of a time that Jesus spoke of when the daily sacrifice will be stopped and the abomination that makes desolate will be set up. Well, brethren, you can't stop something until it's started. Now, a temple doesn't have to be entirely completed. The precedent that is recorded in the book of Ezra was simply a rededication of the site, a dedication of the altar, and sacrifices were resumed while construction on the temple took place. The Bible doesn't say how long such a thing will continue. There are rumors and there are statements that come from private sources that indicate uh, that uh, a deal and accommodation has already been made. I don't know whether it has or not. It will become apparent whether it has, but I can tell you that ultimately something shall. The stage is being set. The scenery is being rearranged. We're living in a totally different world. There's no way that a German-led, revived United States of Europe could ever have emerged in the shadow of an all-powerful Soviet Union which feared the Germans. No way. And if you people who looked at the scene just a matter of a few years earlier, that appeared to be the eternal order of things. All of the, the government, State Department experts and CIA experts and all the rest of them, none of them foresaw. None of them understood. Because you see, there is a fourth dimension in world affairs, and that is the spirit dimension. God rules. God has a plan and a purpose, and we are now emerging in the final days. In the final days, in the final setting of that time. The stage is being set. Even as we meet here right now, the stage is being set for the final act. The curtain will rise, and Babylon the Great will emerge on the scene. One thing we should learn from the events that took place in 1989 in Europe, when God's time comes for events to happen, things can drag on and you think that nothing is happening and you can't see anything changing. Not really. Things drag on and they drag on. When God's time comes, things can happen so quickly. You remember how quickly it happened? Just seemingly overnight. Brethren, when God's time comes, things can drag on and often do longer than we would have imagined, but when they happen, they will happen more quickly than we could have ever thought. Now, what is it that we need to be doing? What, how does that relate to us? These events are setting the stage for the crisis at the close that will culminate in the return of Jesus Christ and the establishment of the government of God on this earth when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. We're moving into those days. Christ talked about to the Pharisees and to others of His day. And He said, you look at the weather and you can tell when you look whether, uh, whether the, uh, there's a front that's moving in, whether it'll be fair, or whether there's a storm coming. You can look at the trees when they begin to bud out and you know that the summer is near. You need to discern the signs of the times. We need to understand the times in which we live because there are many warnings of God's people going to sleep. Christ doesn't warn of things unless it's important. You can read the warnings, Matthew 24 and other places. But I would just call your attention in closing to what we need to be doing. In Romans 9.28, there is an important statement. Romans 9.28, the Apostle Paul says, For he will 
finish the work. He will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. A short work will the Lord make upon the earth. The work of God is not simply going to peter out and dribble away. The work of God will be finished. God says so. The work of God will be finished. It will be cut short in righteousness. In righteousness. A short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Now, that's going to happen. That's going to occur. You want to know who's going to do that short work? I can show you. I can show you chapter and verse exactly who's going to do that short work. Turn back, if you will, to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11 in verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall turn many, shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword, by the flame, by captivity, and by the spoil many days. When they shall fall, they shall be helped with a little help. Many shall cleave to them with flatteries. Some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, to purge, to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it's yet for a time appointed. This is a thumbnail sketch of the history of the people of God, the trials, the ups, the downs. But notice here, who will do the exploits? Who will do the work? Those that know their God will be strong and do exploits. The work will be done by those who have the spiritual strength and wherewithal to accomplish and finish it. And the only source of that spiritual strength and stamina is to know God. Not simply to know about Him. Oh, there are a lot of people that know about God. They've heard about Him. They've read about Him. They've been told about Him. A lot of people know about all sorts of public figures. They've heard about them, they've read about them, they've seen them on television, but they don't know them. Brethren, it's not enough simply to know about God, to have heard about Him or been told about Him. We've got to know our God, to know God, to walk with God, to go through our life, talking to God, listening to God, going through and living our lives, walking with God. To know our God. Those that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. The only source of spiritual strength for survival and accomplishment in the years ahead is knowing our God. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 9 and verse 4, John chapter 9 and and verse 4, Jesus made the statement, I must work the works of Him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. Brethren, the night of the great tribulation is going to ring down on this earth. Between now and then, we must work the works of Him that has sent us. We must work the works of Him that sent us while it is day, because the night comes when no man can work. Let's notice finally back in Revelation, or back in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10, verse 32. The Apostle Paul writes, But call to remembrance... The former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction. Remember your calling. Remember the trials and the difficulties and the adversities you went through. You were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. You either went through it yourself or you had others and friends that you saw go through these trials and these difficulties and these afflictions. Verse 35, "...cast not away therefore." Your confidence, which has great recompense of reward, for you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. We're not of them that draw back unto perdition but of them that believe to the saving of the soul, to the saving of our life. Brethren, he that shall come will come. Yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. He really will. The time is really coming in the years ahead of us when the trumpet will blast and the sky will part and Jesus Christ will return to this earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. And the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. Yet a little while, and He that shall come will come. 
He really, really will. We need to understand that. And between now and then, we need to be busily about our Father's business.